اب میں درخواست کرتا ہوں بہت ادب کے ساتھ اپنے مہمان خصوصی کو موصوف اصل گجرات نوساری کے رہنے والے ہیں اس کے بعد ان کے آبا و اجداد انگلینڈ چلے گئے عالم دین ہیں اور وہاں یونیورسٹی سے ڈاکٹریٹ بھی کیا ہے امریکہ میں دس سال تک امامت بھی کی ہے اور میرا جی چاہے گا کہ اگر آپ اس مجمع کو اس زبان میں خطاب کریں جو آپ کے لیے آسان ہوگا اور وہ انگریزی زبان ہے میں درخواست کروں گا امام صاحب کی زندگی سے متعلق اور ان کے علوم اور باقی چیزوں سے متعلق آپ مجمع کو مخاطب کریں ڈاکٹر مولانا عبد الرحمان منگیرا صاحب بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ حمد کثیر طیب مبارک فی مبارک علیہ کما یحب ربنا و یرضا جل جلاله وعم نواله والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد بل هو آيات بينات في صدور الذين أوتوا العلم وما يجحد بآياتنا إلا الظالمون صدق الله العظيم My dear respected elders, I want to, uh, and uh, our friends here, I want to actually thank uh, Mawlana Rahmatullah Sahib. I wish I could actually speak to you in Kashmiri, unfortunately I can't. It sounds Afghani to me. It sounds like Pashto to me. But it sounds really nice. I wish I could learn it one day, inshallah. Hopefully you can understand English anyway. That's what I'm going to be speaking to you in. Uh, what I want to mention uh, today, mashallah, you've heard many great pearls of wisdom already. What I want to mention to you today is that in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever anybody had a question, it was very simple. They would go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ask him, what is the answer to this issue, this question? And he would either respond to them straight away, or he would wait for a revelation, a wahi, and then after that he would uh, give them an answer. After the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, during the time of the Sahaba, and the time of the Tabi'een, because the Prophet ﷺ was no longer in the dunya, whenever people had a question, they would then go to the Sahaba, and then after that the Tabi'een. What happened is, some of the Sahaba had heard certain things from the Prophet ﷺ. Another Sahabi had heard maybe something slightly different about the same issue from the Prophet ﷺ. So, there seems to be an apparent difference of opinion. I'll give you a simple example. One of the examples is that one Sahabi relates that when a person is fasting, it is not permissible, you should not, a husband should not kiss his wife. And another Sahabi relates that the Prophet ﷺ allowed that to happen. In one case, the Prophet ﷺ said you shouldn't. In another case, he said it's okay, it can be done. So, you have what seems to be two conflicting narrations. Which one is right? Which one is correct? How do you deal with this? So they are both right. The Prophet ﷺ said both things. But the one answer which he said that you should not kiss your wife, this was for somebody who was young, newly married, because if that person kissed his wife, then maybe he would not be able to withhold himself, and he would carry on and maybe break his, uh, break his uh, fasting. Uh, those who are probably newly married or not married may understand what I'm saying. Do you guys have any response? Uh, do you guys understand what I'm saying? Yes? Okay, alhamdulillah. Now the other person who he said that it's okay for you to kiss your wife, this was an older person, he's a veteran in marriage. He can kiss his wife, there's no problem. What we mean by a kiss is on the cheek or something like this, nothing more than that. So this is how the ulama, they looked at these conflicting narrations, and they tried to provide a way to understand them, and the fatwa in the situation. So you had the likes of Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, then Imam Shafi'i, Imam uh, Malik rahmatullahi alayhi in Medina Munawwara, Imam Abu Hanifa was in Kufa, and you had Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, you had Imam Awza'i, 
uh, in, in Syria, you had Layth ibn Sa'd uh, in Egypt, rahmatullahi alayhim. You had numerous other great ulama who were doing this work of trying to explain the Qur'an and Sunnah to uh, the people to respond to them. Slowly, slowly though, within 150, 200 years, 200 years or so, the ummah eventually concentrated on just the four madhabs. The madhab of Imam Tabari, of Layth ibn Sa'd, of Ja'far al-Sadiq, of uh, Imam Awza'i, Dawud al-Zahiri, etc. They all died out. They did not continue. It was only these four that continued. Now, if we uh, just to look at Imam Abu Hanifa quickly, Rahmatullahi alayhi. The way Imam Abu Hanifa's story is actually a very inspirational story. And I say this because it gives many of us a lot of hope. Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi, did not start studying when he was a young boy. He was a, a businessman, a very successful trader. He used to sell cloth. He was very shrewd. While he was a businessman, he had developed a good understanding of the Islamic Aqeedah. And before he studied fiqh and masail and jurisprudence at all, before he studied it, he was proficient and an expert in Aqeedah. That's why he himself says that more than 20 times I went to Basra. He was in Kufa. Kufa and Basra were two cities that were uh, established in the time of Umar and Khattab radiallahu anhu, brand new cities, right, for the Muslims who had uh, gone there, the Sahaba, etc. So Basra was a place that was always problematic. I don't know if you have a place like this in India, one city where lots of firqe come out of, a lot of sectarians come out of. There's just a natural uh, propensity within the people that they uh, have this uh, uh, idea of always debating people. So in Basra, uh, in Basra you you had uh, various groups of the Mu'tazilites and uh, of the Shia and Rawafid and many, many other groups. Imam Abu Hanifa said, I went there over 20 times to debate with the people and Alhamdulillah he managed to convince them. Before, this was before he studied any fiqh at all. This was while he's a businessman. So I see that I'm sure there's many business people sitting here. If you think that you can't do anything, look at the example of Abu Hanifa. While he is there, he's also uh, doing, he's also giving service to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day, somebody came and asked him a question, a fiqhi question. And he says, well, I don't know the answer. He says, go and ask Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman, rahmatullahi alayhi, who was teaching fiqh in the masjid. And when you find the answer, Come and let me know as well, because I want to know as well. So when she came back, when the, the person who questioned him came back and gave him the response, he says, Khalas, let me drop all of this. And he went and he sat in Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman's majlis and he started studying fiqh. Now he's such an intelligent genius that Imam Malik, when, he, when Imam Abu Hanifa went to uh, Medina Munawwara and he met Imam Malik, rahmatullah, they had a meeting, then he came out. And then somebody asked Imam Malik, rahmatullahi alayhi, what do you think of him? Because everybody had heard of this great man from Kufa who has all of these, uh, this great fiqh. So now they all wanted to know who is this person. So Imam Malik says that, رَأَيْتُ رَجُلًا لَوْ كَلَّمَ هَذِهِ السَّارِيَةِ ذَهَبًا لَقَامَ بِحُجَّتِهِ Which means that I've just seen a man who, if he claims that this pillar, any one of these pillars, is made of gold, he would be able to prove it to you. He was such an intelligent genius with all of his righteousness and piety. So eventually then he excelled in fiqh as well. Before he was an expert in aqidah, then he became an expert in fiqh. And subhanallah, then uh, we know the rest of the story because the half of the ummah today is basically following that, uh, following that. Now why does half of the ummah follow the Hanafi school? Was it a conspiracy? Was it a plan? It was no plan at all. This was just an organic reaction that some of the best understanding of fiqh, especially through the Abbasid empire, especially through the Abbasid Empire, whenever they would establish qadis and judges in different parts of their uh, realm and their dominion, they would generally choose Hanafi qudat, Hanafi qadis and Hanafi judges, who then would have Hanafi muftis, and thus it spread. Then of course, after that you had a number of other uh, dynasties, and then after that you had uh, the Uthmani Caliphate, and thus uh, about 50% of the world is, uh, is generally throughout. I mean, if you just look at the Indian subcontinent, uh, Pakistan, uh, 
uh, you know, we, we're talking about 400, 500 million Muslims just around in this area. Uh, and then after that, you look in China, there's about 100 million Muslims there who are Hanafis. Uh, 